Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent former federal officials and special guests for a dynamic discussion of the most important political and legal topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. No sooner had the Manhattan jury foreperson pronounced guilty 34 times than Trump and his surrogates initiated a coordinated public campaign to trash the verdict and the case and lay it all at the feet of President Biden. None of the critics disputed the facts that the Manhattan DA had proven, nor the import of those facts as potentially having interfered with the 2016 election. In fact, few, if any, of the critics even had seen or heard the trial proceedings. But that didn't stop them from pillorying the judge, doxing the jury, calling for criminal prosecutions of the members of the January 6th committee, and issuing a literal call to arms. The attack on President Biden was particularly ironic since not only was the case brought by a state district attorney, but Biden's son Hunter last week went on federal trial for gun charges that themselves were inconsistent with long-standing DOJ policy in analogous cases. The charges had the whiff of political influence as the special counsel handling the case, a Trump administration holdover, had brought them only after Republicans on the Hill had lambasted him for going easy on the younger Biden in a plea bargain that had unraveled in court. Elsewhere, Biden moved to get something of an upper hand on Republicans in the perennially vexing area of immigration with an executive order that accomplished modest parts of the bipartisan deal that previously had been derailed by Trump, who prefers to campaign on the claim that the system is broken than to try to fix it. To analyze these pitched battles on their own terms, but also through the prism of raw power politics and the coming election that has taken over our discourse, we welcome three of the country's most well-known political thinkers and practitioners. And they are Congressman Ted Lieu, serving in his fifth term representing California's 36th Congressional District in the U.S. House. He sits on the House Judiciary and the Foreign Affairs Committees and serves as Vice Chair of the Democratic Caucus. The congressman's a former active duty officer in the U.S. Air Force and also served in the Reserves, retiring with the rank of Colonel in 2021. Thank you, as always, for your service, Congressman Liu, and thank you for returning to Talking Feds. Honored to be on the show. Bill Crystal, the editor-at-large at The Bulwark and the founder and director of Defending Democracy Together. He served in senior positions in two administrations before founding The Weekly Standard in 1995. He is the host of the excellent video series and podcast, Conversations with Bill Crystal. Good to see you back, Bill. Good to be with you, Harry. And Tara Setmeyer a senior advisor for the Lincoln Project and co-host of their Tour de Force show, The Breakdown, (laughs) with Rick Wilson and others, where I've been lucky enough to be a guest several times. Prior to joining the Lincoln Project, Tara was a CNN political commentator and Republican communications director on Capitol Hill, and she is also a resident scholar at the UVA Center for Politics. Welcome back, Tara Setmeyer. Always a pleasure, Harry. All right, let's start with the Trumpian and MAGA backlash to the Trump conviction. So the seismic aftershocks continue from Trump's conviction on 34 felony counts in New York. Republicans have been both bitter and dismissive. Trump and Speaker Mike Johnson are calling on the U.S. Supreme Court to somehow step in. Let's just start here. You know, what is the Republicans' basic beef, and is it at all legitimate? No, no, and no. The Republicans have decided to abdicate their rule of law party moniker to become the party of enabling criming. The reaction afterward, which was so coordinated, they knew that Donald Trump was guilty of sin. They know that he's been guilty of a lot of other things, and they had to come up with something because they've been all in now. They're all in. If they didn't off-ramp from him after January 6th, for goodness sakes, 
Did you think that they were going to do it here? No. The only thing they could do was attack the process. And I remember a time, and Bill will too, when Republicans used to go after Democrats for complaining about process, right? Oh, you know, you're going after the process. That's so weak. And it's like they're becoming everything they claim to despise, including now undermining our jury system. Donald Trump was convicted by a jury of his peers. The system worked here, but they don't like that because it's their guy now, regardless of how obvious it is or embarrassing it is for them to be such hypocrites on this issue. There is no shame. And it just bothers me because they continue to undermine institutions that are really important to our democracy. Now they're going after the justice system, a jury trial that was free and fair for Donald Trump and came to the right conclusion, in my opinion. What I found striking is that not a single high profile Republican actually says Donald Trump was innocent. They don't say he didn't have sex with Stormy Daniels. They don't say that he didn't pay hush money to try to cover it up. They don't say he didn't falsify his business records. They didn't say any of that. And so that was very striking to me uh, that they're out there complaining, but none of them have actually said that somehow the jury's verdict was wrong or that somehow Donald Trump was actually innocent. Both are very good points of this. It is striking for me also, though, the the breadth and depth, I guess, of the reaction, and it wasn't quite a reaction, this was pre-planned, as Tara said, of the of the assault on the legal and judicial system. There are many ways you can criticize an individual verdict, an individual decision to prosecute. You can say more in sorrow than in anger, perhaps, that you think the jury got it wrong, prevail on appeal. I knew people who had legal troubles over the years in Republican administrations, some of them maybe unfortunately just, some of them unjust, I think. And we and we complained about it and uh, wished it hadn't happened that way and made some detailed critiques of particular rulings and judgments of the judges or of what might happen on appeal. We're getting almost none of that. And it's quite the contrary. They relish the thought of, of going after the entire system as rigged, of trying to discredit the entire legal and judicial system, which is on the one hand, mind-bogglingly irresponsible and dangerous. On the other hand, it does reveal a lot about them. They're not interested in having slightly different balance of power between the defense and the prosecution in complicated business records cases. You know, They're not interested in the whole, in the questions of prosecutorial discretion. Maybe there's been too much discretion in some cases and all that. They're not interested in any of that. They are interested in delegitimizing assist this system. Why? To lay the groundwork for Donald Trump, if he's elected president, to do all kinds of things against the system or within the system to subvert the system that are much more radical than we've seen, I think, any president of either party try to do. I wanted to add a couple comments because I attended the trial. And to the congressman's point, you know, nobody from any side who was there would have seen anything other than a routine, in the best sense, full and fair proceedings in which the judge leaned over backwards. And there is just no doubt about the facts as presented. Nobody is saying otherwise. And so the argument really should be why something like this shouldn't be taken seriously, perhaps even something about a single state prosecuting a former president. But it is so much a less nuanced argument than that, so much a kind of wrecking ball position. And also to Tara's point, it was interesting to me because he was all the time railing against it, but portraying a sort of braggart's confidence that uh, in the verdict. And then a day or two before is when he started to say, uh, not even whatever, Mother Teresa could win. In other words, he knew he was going to lose. So you've had in the wake of the convictions issues about the jury instructions and the like. Fair enough. But that's a very weak grounding for what, as you say, Bill, is such a comprehensive all-out assault on the justice system, on what was a workaday and a, even a splendid instance of the foundational role of the criminal justice system and the jury trial. Let me ask you, because he really is pounding his chest with this, calling himself, this is, we're back to Trump now, political prisoner and wanting, it would seem, to make it a kind of label he wears with pride. Is that really feasible? Is he, are we going to see Trump the political prisoner as a actual, you know, main feature of this campaign? Well, we have already. Right. Ever since the indictments, Donald Trump has been capitalizing on this politically with his base, with the MAGA base. 
this is catnip for them. And it has been. He's raised an exorbitant amount of money. He marketed his never surrender, surrender photo, which I think the irony of that is just <laughs> beyond. But this has been something that we've seen him lean into heavily. And it's worked thus far politically for him with his base, which is the most important part. Where I see this becoming problematic for him is for the greater public that's looking at this, that's not part of the cult of personality here for Trump, saying, okay, wait a minute. Now he's a convicted felon. Am I comfortable with this person leaning into this, disparaging our criminal justice system, and now possibly becoming president of the United States again? I mean, if this were any one of us, we wouldn't qualify to walk in the door of a job that required a security clearance. And we keep our head down. I mean, he's scheduled to be sentenced July 11th. Is right. he going to walk into town with, the, I'm the new big felon in the party? Can he? Yes. Is that really <laughs> the brand he wants to uh, lead with? I say yes, but, but deep down inside, and Mary Trump knows this, she obviously knows the psychology of her uncle uh, better than anyone, but she said that he's scared to death of going to jail or, you know, the consequences of that. I would argue that everything behind Donald Trump is the scared little boy who was rejected by his mother and father as a kid. So he might put off this bravado and get that adulation from his cult followers. But deep down inside, he's terrified. And if you don't believe me, just look at the unhinged press conference he had day after he was convicted. And you saw a very disheveled, unhinged person who is not grounded in reality. I look at one other thing as well which is his actually not daring to disobey the gag order after Mir Chan says, I will put you in. Mm -hmm. I think even a day or two in jail and what he looks like if and when he emerges is, you know, deflating of his, an image built over a lifetime. I do think though that I, I don't think he's being irrational from his own political point of view. Look, he's, once he's convicted, he's convicted. People are going to say, convict, people like us are going to say, convict the felon. Lincoln Project is going to say it. Republican <laughs> voters against Trump's going to say it. Some fair number of Democrats are going to say it. So he's got to figure out, what do I do with that? Do I say, well, it wasn't really that important a case. It was kind of complicated. It's on appeal. Most people, it wasn't really a felony. It should have been a misdemeanor. But as he say, they were after me. It's a setup. And I agree with Tara that it appeals to the base, certainly. But I'm less confident that Swing voters don't also get a little bit influenced by it. Three or four months of this being pummeled by this kind of rhetoric, maybe they start to think, I don't know, maybe it was kind of a setup, you know? And I, I've heard of other cases where people got uh, unjustly convicted. And I know people who got, got screwed over it by some DA they didn't like and or heard of such cases. And so I, I'm pretty worried. We shouldn't underestimate just the ability. It's a, it's a vulgar and false propaganda exercise. But of course, propaganda sometimes works and sometimes works in a not very subtle way. And I, I'm worried that this might work, especially if there's not a real pushback about why people should take the felony and the conviction seriously and what it implies for what he'll do as president. Because I don't think it's gonna be enough to just say convicted felon, I'm happy to say it, but you know, for something that happened in 2016, 2017, New York State business records case, it has to be, this exemplifies who he is and the reaction exemplifies what he and MAGA will do in a MAGA, in a Trump MAGA second term, which will be very different from a first term where there were some constraints, some guardrails, some people who said, no, you, Mr. President, you can't go that far. They will not be there in the second term. And I will say that that argument has not been made enough, in my opinion. I run into swingish voters all the time, ex, you know, as an ex-Republican, some who are still sort of Republican. Oh, come on, Bill, you said the first term would be horrible. It was, there were some bad things and he's kind of a loose cannon, but you know, basically things, this country still works. Biden took over, the system works. Look, it works so well that he got convicted and died and convicted. So what are you so worried about? What would one more term of Trump do that's so terrible? And I do think, I think there's an opportunity to bring home how dangerous a Trump second term could be. I think the swing voter that is going to vote for Trump because he was convicted, we were unlikely going to get that swing voter anyways. I thought what was telling is the New York Times ran a piece, their poster, who basically said they went back to the sort of relatively uninformed, disengaged voter, and about a quarter of them, 25%, said they're now going to go back and vote for Biden. Uh, so I thought this might be helpful to people who weren't paying very much attention, of folks that don't watch politics, and all of a sudden they're seeing this news that, oh, Donald Trump is now a convicted felon. That, uh, I think, is probably marginally helpful to Biden and might be more helpful as, as the next few months keep going along. But I think for the long term, it was enormously important for the United States because any future president 
is not going to take the risk that they might go through a jury and get convicted of something far more serious by a state prosecutor or local prosecutor. And I think that's going to keep future presidents in line uh, in a way that had this jury gone the other way would have emboldened future presidents to ignore the law. And just that the system worked under tremendous pressure, you know, he, he was coming out every day with the Speaker of the House, really high country officials, pummeling it completely, and they and everyone just uh, did her his job. To Bill's point of trying to bring home the broader implications of a second term, I mean, no absence of material to work with. We have just today, the, you know, the Republican war cry has been just that, a call to arms. We have both Steve Bannon, who is actually finally going to begin serving a contempt sentence in a few weeks, and Trump calling for, as if it's some kind of retribution or eye for an eye justice, the convictions of the members of the January 6th committee. You have what Trump calls in in his very cloddish kind of capitalization, the unselect committee or whatever. So, I mean, to really arrest and ban in, absolutely talking like a street punk revolutionary. Jurors have been doxxed. So you have sounded the alarm and there's much to work with, but man, how loud should that alarm be? Tara, I'll go back to you. I mean, <laughs> there's a real effort afoot, it seems to be, to turn again to violence, to intimidate That's uh, hard to call just talk, right, with this crowd. Since January 6th, everyone needs to realize that it is not just talk anymore. And it's been very frustrating to watch the January 6th federal case not move forward because of various reasons, delays with the Supreme Court and the immunity case and all of that. But it was really difficult to take that because the American people should know whether Donald Trump is adjudicated and convicted for his involvement in what happened on January 6th. That is, to me, one of the most offensive things that he has done out of a very long list of offensive things that Donald Trump has done because it goes to the core, it's a cornerstone of our democracy, our free and fair elections and the peaceful transfer of power. And he has literally gotten away with inciting an insurrection and a potential coup without consequence. And the idea now that they continue to frame this that those people are political prisoners and that he's going to pardon these hostages and that the brave men and women police officers who defended the Capitol that day, our temple of freedom, are somehow crisis actors or not worthy of being honored for their service and sacrifice and what they went through. Somehow they're the villains. It's the world turned upside down. And so the fact that Trump and MAGA is leaning into January 6th and that there's been no real consequence for it, except for, a, what, 800, 900 people who have been convicted or or pled guilty and some in p- serving prison terms or whatever for their involvement, the foot soldiers. But the bigger fish really haven't paid a price. That's just a practice run. It's a practice run, which is why you hear the rhetoric ramping up, ramping up, ramping up more, because they get off on the idea of the violence. Buy guns and ammo. Get ready. Gear That's up. right. Yeah. It's part of the authoritarian playbook. And they're, and they're checking off the boxes every week. And to Bill's point, we do have to do a better job. I know we do do that. But as a collective, those of us have platforms have got to continue to explain what the stakes are and what a second term looks like because they tell us every day what they're trying to do. And it starts with retribution and revenge. And Bill, as you've pointed out, conservative media has been jumping in. The, you, you talked about the Federalist and Sean Davis speaking in like end of days, final battle terms. Yeah. I mean, they are all in as well. The whatever is remains of the, you know, opinion elite or influencers of the party. Yeah. Yeah. And there are these different strains, right? There's the ones who incite the activists, the Bannon types and Bannon protégés and Bannon wannabes. There's the Wall Street Journal editorial page, which has the more sophisticated arguments for this was really unjust and very unfortunate. And here's a piece by John Yu, distinguished law professor out there on the West Coast with you, uh, saying that uh, really the only way to stop this kind of thing is retribution. And Trump himself saying, let's prosecute the members of the January 6th committee. I take it he wants to prosecute not just the staff, but maybe the members of Congress as well, and thinks that that's fine. And we all say, well, that's ludicrous, that's ridiculous. I don't know. Are we confident that he won't put someone in as acting AG who will in turn put a lot of people in beneath 
him or her and fire a lot of other people and use alleged Schedule F procedures to start bringing these cases? Are we confident that in Texas and Alabama and Florida that people aren't going to start bringing state cases? That they will say, well, hey, you brought a state case against our guy. We're bringing state cases against your guy. And God knows what it could be, right? I mean, there's so many things they could invent. So I think we're underestimating what Trump, with these organs of government, and with all these apologists and enablers, can do. And incidentally, these business types, these very wealthy Wall Street types, suddenly, well, I think I'm okay with Trump. I think I might support him. Biden, terrible. This has happened after the indictment. Some of this has happened after the conviction. This is not, I mean, what does that say? right? You're head of a huge business enterprises, and you're fine with having a convicted felon as president of the United States. One last point, I've gotten on too long. I, I was struck by this, though, a couple of weeks ago when we were all talking about this. In 1973, uh, Spurhag, who didn't plead guilty, actually pleaded, I think, no contest, to tax exemption, which was really a, uh, an extortion case from when he was governor and county executive, pled to one count, got no jail, and resigned the vice presidency. And I, I was in just beginning grad school then. I remember you know, following it closely. Everyone assumed, of course, if he's found guilty, he has to resign the vice presidency. I mean, you couldn't have a vice president who's a convicted felon. That was the argument. It wasn't for anything he had done as vice president. People could have said, fine, he did that six, seven years ago. But I mean, no one even is even raising the argument that, gee, maybe as a convicted felon, Donald Trump shouldn't be nominated by the Republican Party for the presidency. You're not even considering it, Bill, right? It's like not even- Right, that's like out of the discussion. I'm struck by this finally, I'm curious to know what Ted thinks of this as an elected official. The voters actually have this slightly naive view, which is better, which is, I don't know, maybe he shouldn't run if he's convict if convicted felon. You see all these polls that show like large numbers of Americans saying he shouldn't even run for office. And then people like us say, well, he's running. I mean, that's, out of the, that's not an issue. So the question is, could it move 2% of the electorate, 4% of the electorate over to, from Trump to Biden? But in a way, the voters are kind of have the right instinct, which is, what are we doing here? Spiro Agnew resigned as vice president in office because of this conviction of something six or seven years ago. And everyone just thought, of course, you can't have a vice president who's a convicted felon. And we're toying with the notion of having a president who's a convicted felon. So I agree with what Tara and Bill said. And I just want to note that uh, Tara got quite angry when she was talking about the fact that these cases are being delayed. And to me, I think if November becomes a referendum on whether Trump faces justice, I think you're going to have some motivation for turnout among Democrats and swing voters that lean Democratic uh, in a way that maybe we wouldn't have if these cases had gone through. Uh, so I think it's not clear what it means for these cases to be delayed because anger motivates a lot of people to go out and take actions like, like go vote. Uh, so we'll see what happens uh, in November. But I, I do know a lot of my constituents are pretty upset all these cases are delayed and it's motivating to take action. Bill, but with everyone. So you've written about how Biden is very has a sort of light touch, but as you've put it, he's at least a few times twisted the knife on the felony conviction and trying to conceptualize it in terms of what you said, like, you know, the threat he poses to the, like, the American project. So is that the way to go here? Should Joe Biden mention nothing about this, but have surrogates be pounding it? How is and how should the leadership of the party be talking about the convictions. It's complicated. I, I think they need to be aggressive. There's limits to what he should do himself, though I don't know how he's allowed to raise it. He's running for president against the guy. I mean, <laughs> what was suddenly deciding that like you can't raise the fact that he was just convicted of a felony, it's a little weird. I don't 34. Believe, 34. <laughs> yeah, 34. I don't believe that that would happen if the shoe were on the other foot. I believe the Republicans are running against the Biden crime family when they haven't, none of them is convicted of anything, right? And so yep. that doesn't mean the turnabout's fair play. Obviously, Biden should hold himself to a higher standard and so forth. But they need serious surrogates if they're going to. So they need people with credibility and some renown in the legal world to be out there on TV every night just hammering away at what this means. And as what you said earlier, what he and Bannon have said about, about retribution going forward and John Yu and all this kind of what it would look like with a Trump Justice Department and a Trump FBI uh, and a Trump DHS and a Trump DOD and so forth. And I, that I don't feel people are doing nearly enough. I, I think there's some good issues for Democrats and they're running on those, reproductive rights and so forth, but the, they are not painting a picture as much as maybe they could 
of what a Trump second term would look like. Now, whether you can bring that home to voters who are pretty far away from the federal bureaucracy and from all these things, I suppose you could argue, well, what do they know about who should be making decisions of the Justice Department? But I think people have a sense. People have a sense. They have a sense of local state government, for one thing. You want honest and nonpartisan people, if you get a traffic ticket, adjudicating your case. You don't want everything to be fixed. You don't, you don't want everything to be rigged, and they want to rig everything, I mean, in a sense. And if you're running a business, you're not going to be entirely safe from selective IRS investigation and worse and contracts and so forth. So all the that whole aspect of Trump, I feel like there's been too much focus, in my opinion, on kind of his personal peculiarities, vulgarity, you know, saying this thing and bad thing and that bad thing, and not enough on what an actual Trump administration, how authoritarian, how lawless it could be. I agree with that 100%, actually. And I think that that's why as the summer unfolds and as we get through the conventions, when people start to pay more attention to this, that has to be driven home. We should be done with diagnosing Trump and his pathologies. That's already baked in. We know what they are. And he's never changing. So people seem to be okay with him being a malignant narcissist. And so it's like, okay, well, he's unhinged. He's a malignant narcissist. And this is what he's going to do. This is what that actually means. And start making the parallels and start juxtaposing his words and behavior with what he plans to do. And I always say this, well, a lot of times when I'm on air discussing this, I say, don't take my word for it. Take his and his people because they tell us every time he speaks, every time they're out there, they reference what they plan to do. Just like you talked about with the invoking violence, revenge. There was another article this week about how Republicans are planning revenge against their enemies. It's all over the place. And they have Project 2025. They wrote a freaking manifesto to tell us what they plan to do. Now, it's a thousand pages almost. They anticipate no one's actually going to read it. But there are those of us who have, and you can extrapolate the top lines or the lowlights of it to say to people, this is what they want to do. You don't believe me? It's written down. This is their guide and make it relatable to them on how it will impact their everyday freedoms in this country and change the American way of life that we know, love, and want to save and protect. Congressman, you've been a candidate not just in federal, but also in state elections. I mean, you have a sort of a community sense as well as a national landscape. It strikes me that that people with your experience would say it's somehow a kind of a heavy lift. It's one thing to talk about economic conditions today or things that are, you know, maybe will play out in the next week, what crime is like. But the appeal to these fundamental democratic values, they are also kind of abstract. And maybe as Bill was talking about with the swing voters, people think of it as alarmist. Oh, it's not really going to be like that. As a matter of sort of retail politics, How challenging is the kind of message that Tara was just propounding that, you know, Democrats should be bringing? It is difficult to move a voter if that voter has a lot of information. Uh, So if you're a voter that pays attention uh, to politics, you're either going to vote for Trump, you're going to vote for Biden. And it's very hard to convince you otherwise. So a lot of the battle is going to be among low information voters. And then this particular very small group now of high information voters that sort of going, oh, you know, I don't know why I think of Trump. Or I don't know why I think of Biden. That is a very small group of people that's going to be heavily targeted. And there's just be a barrage of ads targeted just at those folks. And it's going to be in six to seven swing states. So those voters, in our opinion, are going to resonate they're going to already bake into their minds that, look, Biden is old and Trump is a militant narcissist. But we do think they might be persuaded on policy, uh, whether it's uh, abortion or you know, capping prescription drug prices or job creation. And so that is what largely the Democratic caucus in the House is focused on. And that's in contrast to the end of the American experiment, I take it? So- we have a positive message of how Democrats will be in control. We pass the infrastructure law to create jobs and lower costs, making goods movement more efficient. We pass Inflation Reduction Act to fund uh, clean energy projects. We pass the American Rescue Plan to get our economy back on track. And then we have a separate 
uh, set of talking points framing the Republican caucus as extreme. They want to take away your reproductive rights. They want to essentially destroy democracy. And that's sort of where it gets fit in. All right. So the Hunter Biden trial kicked off this week, featured testimony from his ex-wife, his ex-girlfriend, who was Bo Biden's widow. I've got terrible misgivings about this case being brought, but there it is. And those misgivings are not things that get in front of the jury. Tara, you've commented that Hunter's story resonates with the Americans who've known addiction or a loved one who was an addict. Does that, you think, make for a sympathetic defendant? Or I could see it the other way, too, where the families just say, you know, nothing's working and and we've got to um, be tough. What's your thoughts about this kind of, to me, overblown and sort of sad and sordid uh, mess of a trial. Your description of it being sad and sordid is the way most reasonable Americans look at this at this point, because Hunter Biden has been dragged through the mud for actions that he's taken. And some of them, I mean, he warrants scrutiny, sure. But he is the son of the president of the United States and former vice president of the United States. And there has been no direct link to anything that Hunter Biden has done to President Biden, that's been pretty clear because I guarantee you if there was anything going on and any link whatsoever, the Republicans would have found it by now. For goodness sakes, they've been beating this drum for many years. So that's because it doesn't exist. But they've created this boogeyman and they're exploiting the addiction troubles of Hunter Biden. And I think that that turns a lot of people off because let's not act like this country doesn't have an addiction problem. There are millions of families in America who have a family member or know someone who struggles with addiction. And Hunter Biden, to his credit, has finally owned up to it, gotten himself clean, and has had to endure the indecency and the embarrassment of what the Republicans have done to him publicly. I mean, showing nude photos of him and and things like that in, in the House, which is just beneath the House of Representatives, but not the current Republicans there now. And he's like, what else do you want from me? You know, I've owned it. And some of this is too much and you're making it up and it's not fair. And he's starting to go on offense and fighting back. And President Biden has handled it, I think, pretty well so far by maintaining that he's a loving father. He often says, I love my son. I'm proud of him. And I think there are a lot of people out there who wish they had a dad or a mom who were as supportive as the president and first lady have been of Hunter, despite his troubles and the embarrassment and the political collateral that it's caused for the president of the United States. But they don't care because they're good and decent people and they're trying to support their son. So I think it backfires. And it also shows that the system isn't rigged because the president's son is on trial. So which is it? Make your mind up, MAGA. Which is it? To add to what Tara says, look, the thing about the Hunter Biden trial, everyone knows what happened. They're reading his you know, own memoirs, et cetera. So it really does come down in some way to the attitude one has toward the facts. So if he is convicted, does the label of felon serve to neutralize Trump's convictions? Or is it, in fact, as Tara suggesting, not that kind of bounty? My view is very few people judge a candidate based on what happens to their family members or their relatives. I think people are going to base it on the two candidates themselves. Something else I wanted to mention, it is not clear to me how people view institutions in general as opposed to institutions in general as applied to Donald Trump. So in terms of elections, for example, we had two very close elections for Senate in Georgia, and no one sort of came out and said, you know, those elections were somehow rigged or the elections were stolen, even though those are pretty close in time to uh, Donald Trump's uh, failed re-election. And then you've had a number of elections since then across America at the local, state, and county level where most people didn't complain at all. Folks very specifically view Trump somewhat differently when it came to his election. So it's not clear to me with this, do people sort of view Hunter Biden and anything related to him very specifically to him as a person versus institutions in general? 
And I tend to think it will probably be very specific to Hunter Biden and whatever happens to Trump, very specific to Trump. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I don't think it really neutralizes Trump. The question is whether it plays it. And I think President Biden has, by keeping his distance, by not stopping his own Justice Department from going ahead and, press and bringing this case, even though it might be a little bit questionable and, and some, I don't know, might not be, but it has been questioned by serious nonpartisan experts. He shows that he is not distorting the justice system. Uh, and now he said he won't pardon Hunter Biden, which has you know, gone pretty far, I'd say, in, in making it clear that let the chips fall where they may. So that's, I think President Biden has insulated himself well. And I think that's both the right thing to do, the honorable thing to do, and also politically the right, <laughs> the prudent thing to do. I don't know. I mean, having said all that, he's a grown man who took advantage of, his, of the fact that his father was vice president of the United States to make millions of dollars in shady f deals with foreigners while supporting a drug addict and having all kinds of other fairly deplorable practices, uh, which he didn't come clean about at first. So I am not I do not think it's a sympathetic case. I'm much, I'm sort of less sympathetic than Tara, maybe. And I think it could fit, it does fit into a narrative about Washington. That's what, yeah, you got a 50 year senator. If you're a senator for all this time, you have all this, you know, your family lives off you. They hire you, people hire you to get access. And then not just a senator, but vice president. And there is Hunter Biden saying, I'm going to talk to my dad about this if you don't come through, Mr. Chinese businessman or whoever, whichever they're kind of trying to get money out of abroad and say nothing of the whole Russia. Charisma, insanity, and stuff. So it's pretty clear Republicans haven't succeeded in pinning anything on Joe Biden. I think it's probably nothing, almost certainly nothing to pin. But I, I think it doesn't help. It helps the Biden as a part of the a swamp creature in Washington narrative a little more alive. And he has been in Washington for an awful long time. And Hunter Biden, you know, unfortunately didn't, unlike his brother, didn't seem to be able to hold things together and made his living, pretty good living it looks like, uh, off of connections to his family. So that's unfortunate, I think. So I, I don't think we should kid ourselves that there's nothing. And they're going to exploit anything that comes out at the trial. If there's two sentences about his father, I think we'll see that. This is where the De Democrats can barely make themselves say the words convicted felon. The Republican Party, or not the party itself, I suppose, but co connected, affiliated groups on the outside, they're not going to shy away from just saying crime family, crime family, crime family over and over again. Which I wish the Democrats would lean back into it and say and talk about Donald Trump's family. I mean, they, unlike Donald Trump, Biden didn't have his son or daughter and son-in-law working in the White House doing business and conducting deals and and nod and wink, God knows what kind of- And $2 billion with the Saudis. With the Saudis after, I totally exactly. agree. God forbid any Democrat could mention the word Jared Kushner. That would be wrong. That would be right. too much like getting into real politics. We have to advance our interpretation of the economic world data. You know, I really wonder about the Democrats sometimes. Maybe they should try to win this election, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, we know Congressman Lou's trying to win this election. He's one of the good guys. <laughs> right. I know. Of one of course. the many. One of the many. But yes, overall, that's it's frustrating for us as Republicans sometimes, well, former Republicans, that they aren't more aggressive going after the other side with this because it's right there. And Republicans have no problem exploiting and demagoguing things, some that aren't even real, but it doesn't matter. Perception is reality in politics, where Democrats actually have facts on their side and can point to this and say, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump were in the White House. They were given security clearances when they were denied because they didn't qualify. You know, Jared Kushner was talking to the Saudi leadership before they went and imprisoned their political opposition and what happened, they chopped up an American journalist and, and like all these things that went on that were so untoward with Qatar and the, I mean, all of it. But everybody forgets that. Republicans make sure you don't forget it. They just repeat, 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 repeat. And then even if it's not true, it becomes true to people because it's the perception. So there's plenty to push back on. If God forbid there is a conviction for Hunter, if that's what it comes out to, that's what it comes out to. But he never worked in the White House or worked in the campaign. Well, and much more than that, I, I just want to say I started with misgivings about the case. I have profound ones, but there it's it's not what you're talking about, Bill. Just remember, nothing about the charges has anything to do with that whole seamy side. He lied on a form to get a gun when he said he wasn't uh, using drugs. and But my main um, brief with the, the case is the DOJ does not indict people 
who lie on forms unless some other serious crime happens. They just don't. And they did what they did here originally, divert the, ch the charges against him, give him a deal as long as he stays clean. That went awry for reasons having nothing to do with him in court. And that they then turn around and after a lot of Republican protests with David Weiss and threw the book at him. So it's, it's as a former prosecutor that this case especially makes me sick to my stomach. I actually think one point about it is it really, to all accounts, pains Biden and Trump, of course, could give a shit. The cruelty is the point always with the Trump side. It's now time to take a moment for our sidebar feature, which explains some of the issues and topics that are prominent in the news. Today's sidebar feature explains why baseball is the only major sport in the United States with a general exemption from federal antitrust laws. And to explain this topic, we welcome Annalise Chen. Annalise Chen's a fiction and nonfiction writer. She was named to the five under 35 by the National Book Foundation in 2019. Her first novel, so Many Olympic Exertions was published in 2017 by Kaya Press and named one of the best books of the year by Brooklyn Rail. I give you Annalise Chen on baseball's antitrust exemption. The majority of sports organizations, like most business interests, are regulated by antitrust laws aimed at preventing monopolistic practices. One American pastime is infamously exempt, baseball. The basis of federal antitrust law is the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act. That law prohibits certain economic activity that restricts competition or interstate commerce in the marketplace. In general, this law aims to prevent the collusion of financial interests to impede the functioning of the free market or the exploitation of consumers. Throughout the mid to late 19th century, the sport and business of baseball expanded in the United States. Multiple professional leagues competed for dominance in the market. The eventual dominance of Major League Baseball, or the MLB, however, was solidified by the Supreme Court's decision in Federal Baseball Club v. National League, 1922. The owner of the Baltimore Terrapins sued the National League and American League for conspiring to undermine the Federal League effectively engaging in anti-competitive practices. The unanimous decision by the court, written by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, found that baseball as a sport was not interstate commerce and therefore the Sherman Act was not applicable. The ruling has been controversial to say the least. Since this ruling, the MLB has faced no major competitors. No other sports agency has been given such an exemption. Critics have claimed that this exemption has given the MLB nearly unchecked authority to engage in unethical business practices that would otherwise be challenged, including exploitation of labor, in particular major league ballplayers. Attempts to overturn the exemption have faltered. In 1953, the court ruled in Toulson v. New York Yankees that the issue should be decided by Congress. In the 1972 case, Flood v. Kuhn, litigants challenged the MLB's practice of preventing players from being, quote, free agents. The court decided that, though the MLB is not subject to antitrust law, it remains subject to commerce regulations. At the same time, however, the court decided that Congress must take the initiative to regulate the MLB. Since then, legal challenges to these exemptions have continually failed. One major change came in 1998, with the Curt Flood Act, which gave players the right to bring labor suits against the MLB. For all non-labor issues, however, the league is still exempt from antitrust law. In recent years, justices on the court have signaled an openness to revisiting the antitrust exemption. This includes Justices Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh. Whether or not and when such a reversal may occur, however, is unclear. For Talking Feds, I'm Annalise Chen. Thank you, Annalise Chen. You can find Annalise's book, So Many Olympic Exertions, at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and other major booksellers.
All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thank you, Harry. Today's spirited debate asks, to decant or not to decant? That is the question. And the short answer is yes. But when should you decant? First off, what is it? Decanting is the process of slowly pouring liquid, in this case wine, from one container to another without disturbing the sediment at the bottom. It is important to separate the wine from the sediment if there is a lot of it because the sediment can dampen the aromas and flavors in your glass. Decanting wine also helps the wine to aerate, which is the process of introducing oxygen to the liquid. No doubt you've heard or even said the phrase, let the wine breathe. Well, that's what decanting does best, allowing those aromas to expand while making the wine more flavorful and balanced. And it's never a bad idea to decant a young, bold wine. In fact, at Total Wine & More, our guides recommend allowing an hour or two for the process to work best. This is not advisable for mature wines that just need to be separated from their sediment. Leaving a mature wine in a decanter for too long could cause flavors to become muted from too much aeration. Remember to taste your wine while decanting to be sure it is not left aerating for too long. And don't forget, the younger and more closed the flavors are when you open the wine, the more it will benefit from the decanting process. Even a few seconds of aeration or a quick swirl in your glass will do wonders to your favorite wine from Total Wine & More. However, the best rule of thumb is, whenever you can, decant. Taste and enjoy when it feels best to you. It's personal. Cheers. Thanks to our friends at Total Wine & More for today's A Spirited Debate. I want to really talk about the Biden executive order about the border. Biden sells it as stepping into the breach of congressional inaction. Let me ask you, Congressman, you know, there was the big deal Congress had and Trump, there's not much dispute about this, said, don't do it. I'd rather a broken system so I could run against it. The order itself, does it come anywhere close to doing the Biden order, what the congressional deal would have done? No. Uh, Democrats agree that our immigration system is broken and we want to have comprehensive immigration reform. The Senate had a negotiated bipartisan bill related to the southern border and Donald Trump torpedoed it and told Republicans to not support it. So what we have is President Biden trying to do what he can through executive orders, but executive orders still have to be within what the legal framework is. He cannot change the law. And so he's doing what he can with an executive order. But you fundamentally need Congress to step in and implement comprehensive immigration reform if we really want to address this problem head on. I'm glad that President Biden has finally done this. It's long overdue. When I worked in Capitol Hill, I worked on the federal law enforcement and immigration issues in addition to my communications director duties. That was way back in 2006, from 2006 to 2013. And we were in a position again back then to have a bipartisan, comprehensive immigration bill that got torpedoed in 2007 and again in 2013. Because Republicans have recognized that this is a great issue to run on. They're not really interested in fixing it. Some were in, in operating in good faith, but now, not anymore. And the ones who did operate in good faith to get that bill, that bipartisan bill this year, they threw their hands up because it, I've got to tell you that if we had seen that kind of bill back in the, my days on Capitol Hill, I think Republicans would have been thrilled because it was actually pretty tough by Democratic standards. It was We had not seen anything like that. Some of the concessions and so, and Republicans today recognize that this could have been a political quote win for the Biden administration because it actually was pretty, pretty darn tough. The American people have asked for this. It is a mess on the southern border. This is something that's been going on for decades. And it's kind of pretty asinine that we as a country can't get it together. And now it's being used as a political football. So for the president to finally put his foot down and do something to move the needle a little bit on what's going on down there. I think is important. It's important. It might be a little too late. I wish he had done this sooner. But I also understand the legal ramifications because when Obama was president, Republicans screamed bloody murder 
when he would use executive action for certain things that Congress wouldn't move on. So it's a give and take. But again, back to perception is reality in politics. And it's bad for the president and his reelection if our southern border is out of control and you have people pouring over it. And it's a political football for Republicans to be able to point their finger and say he's not doing anything. But they are now. So we'll see what happens there. But it's um, I think it was a good move. As long as it stays legally sound. Good. Long overdue, President Biden. Keep it up. <laughs> Bill, you had a conversation actually with David Axelrod where he mentioned Biden has to look like he's seizing control of the situation. Does he look that way now? Is this uh, you know big enough given the limitations the congressman mentioned? I think he probably had to do something like this. And I, I'm not going to criticize him for doing it. It's not my particular favorite policy. I'm such a liberal on immigration. I'm just out of sync with the public on this. There's something nuts, honestly, when you see these polls. Immigration is the top issue facing the country, the border. It's literally crazy. I mean, the border is not the top issue. The border may be the top issue, may be the top issue facing a swath of Southern California, Arizona, and Texas. Not even clear that that's the case. The numbers aren't there. It doesn't have anything like the effect people say it has. And incidentally, reducing immigration is going to hurt the economy. It's going to hurt the effort to keep inflation under control. It's going to hurt the labor supply. But having said all that, it is, as Tyra said, I mean, this has become so baked in now, this notion that it's an issue at the same level as, you know, Putin trying to destroy, you know, quit genocide in Ukraine or, or the big picture or democracy or the Supreme Court. My only concern about it is it sort of legitimates the notion that the issue is the top issue. You had to do that. I guess you had no choice. But he needs to pivot off, and he has with the D-Day trip, I think, to some degree. But I mean, the next president's going to appoint a lot of federal judges and maybe some Supreme Court justices. And we've seen very vividly over the last four years that it kind of matters who's in these jobs and that the span of the, the range of kinds of decisions you can get is much greater than we would have thought 20 or 30 years ago. Shouldn't this be like a big issue? Shouldn't the Supreme Court be a central issue in this campaign? And that's one thing the president really does do. The president doesn't really control the economy. The president doesn't really control the border. You know, the president really does nominate judges and federal judges. Our politics is so out of whack that we're not debating the things that matter. And we're sort of doing a lot of symbolic stuff, you know, on these other matters. Back to perception. That's because Fox News and right wing media has been beating this drum about immigration and migration and the great brown menace and they're coming to get us and the crime. And they've been beating this drum for years and years and years to your point that it's permeated the country into places where the border has really no direct impact on what's happening to them in you know wherever that's not outside the border. They've done a very good job of coordinating the messaging on this for years, convincing the American people that immigration that all the immigrants are coming to get you. I agree with you. We need immigration, but it needs to be orderly. We need to fix this broken asylum system. We need to make sure our, our men and women in the Border Patrol have what they need. We could do that. We need a decent guest worker program. These are things that are fixable, but the Congress is broken and there's no good faith actors anymore beyond a handful of people. And when it's this close like it is now, you're not going to get anything done, which leads to the uh, the other issue of why the House and Senate races in 2024 are just as important as the presidential race. But you know, on that, just on the Congress is broken, this is Ted's thing, not mine, but the Congress functioned. I mean, they actually, Jim Lankford and, and Chris Murphy made a deal. They had a majority for it in the Senate. They would have had a majority in the House. A lot of Democrats, to their credit, I will say, swallowed very hard mm -hmm. and voted for and endorsed an immigration package that they didn't like at all, and the, but they wanted the Ukraine aid and they thought it was necessary for the country. And they went very far. So who torpedoed this deal? One person, Donald Trump. Has the Biden campaign, has the Democratic Party made that point effectively over the last four or five months? I would say no. Does any voter out there know this could have been law, this plus a lot of other things, five months ago? And there's one man. And why are the Republicans, why do they get a, to walk away and say, well, we couldn't do anything because Donald Trump said no? Since when do prospective presidential nominees have veto power over the choices, over the decisions, over the votes of elected officials who were elected in their own right, not to be rubber stamps for Donald Trump. So again, the lack of, some of this is just me complaining about the world, right? But I do feel like the Democratic Party as a whole, the Biden administration, the Biden campaign just haven't done as good a job as they might have in sort of highlighting some of these truly outrageous things where the public would be with them if they knew a little more, I think. I have a question for you, Bill. So every Democrat I know of and the feeds I get from Biden campaign we try to highlight that all the time. And so what I'm sort of curious is maybe it's just sort of different 
media we're, we're looking at, or maybe it's that obviously there's a filter known as the media. And so a thousand Democrats could be saying X and the media wants to talk about Y, then what we say is just not going to sort of go through. Uh, but it's it's interesting that you have that perspective. I know that Tom Swazi, when he won his special election, that is what he talked about, how Trump torpedoed the immigration bill. And that helped him with voters, we believe. And he, he flipped that seat. Uh, but I'm curious, you have that perspective, which sort of tells me the media is, you know, not great often in what it's trying to highlight. No, I, I think it isn't. But I also think Tom Suozzi, I followed that campaign pretty closely, not as close as you did, I'm sure. But Tom Suozzi spent $10 million making that point to his constituents, which is great. That's a free country. We Both parties can buy television advertising. I don't know. Maybe it would have been worth to doing that some in other states, in swing states, uh, between February and June after Trump blew up the deal. Now I know it's too early. Ah, I see. Yeah. Ta if you're talking about paid advertising, I think that's a different point. So I will look into that. That's a good point. Thank you. It's obvious we need a whole, um, <laughs> among other things, a whole episode on this. I, I just very quickly on immigration, it's, it strikes me that it both sides basically say the same things are needed. Yes, tough immigration. Yes, uh, a real outlet. But somehow what controls, it's such an effective issue to demagogue with these images that seem really vivid and effective to people at in Wisconsin, of hordes of rapists coming over the border um, and the like. And, you know, it's been intractable for so long, but the basic equation, I think, is pretty clear. For now, we're sad to say out of time on another great episode. We have just 30 seconds or so for our final feature of Five Words or Fewer, where we take question from a listener and, and we often answer in five words or fewer. And today's question... What was Trump thinking as he saw, I guess if he saw, <laughs> Biden giving his D-Day speech at Normandy? I'll go first. Still suckers and losers. Sad. <laughs> Donald Trump was actually sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, they were suckers. I had the same thought as Tara. That that's, that is what he actually was thinking. EU conspiracy. No rain. We are out of time. Thank you so much to Bill, Congressman Lou, and Tara. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube, where we are posting full episodes, talking books, and bonus video content. You can follow us on Twitter at TalkingFedsPod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon. Talking Feds is a completely independent production, so if you like the work we do and are inclined to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. You can leave voicemails with your questions for me and our guests, whether for talking five or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments, all you have to do is call 727-279-5339 and leave a voice message. You also can still email us your questions at questions at talkingfeds.com. Thanks for tuning in. And don't worry, as long as you need answers, the feds will keep talking. Talking Fez is produced by Catherine Devine. Associate producer, Gabriella Glick. Sound engineering by Matt McArdle. Our research producer is Zeke Reed. Rosie Don Griffin and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Production assistants by Akshaj Turbailu and Anna Salvatore. Thanks very much to Annalise Chen for explaining baseball's antitrust exemption. Our music, as always, is by the amazing Philip Glass. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later. Talking Feds.